I was tagged in this tag. Ugh. Tag, 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 tag. Maybe we should play a drinking game. Every time I say the word tag, you take a shot. It would be wasted by the end of the video. Hi there, my name is Caitlin Bandy and this is my channel, Bandy's Books. Today we are back with another book tag for Tag Tuesday. And I'm just catching up on a tag that I was tagged in back in May. Unfortunately, over the summer, as I've mentioned in a few other videos, I did have some health issues that required me to take a little bit of time away from YouTube. So I didn't get around to doing this tag when I was originally tagged in it, but I did see the tag and I did want to complete this video. So thank you to Bookish for tagging me in this originally. This particular tag challenge was created by Kristen at Enter the Book. And it's all about how you acquire books for your collection. Do you, you know, your purchasing habits. And I thought it was really interesting because a lot of times I'm here talking to you about specific books, not books as a general subject. So I thought this might be a little bit of fun to kind of learn a little bit about my method of buying books and how I decide what stays on my shelves. So let's just go ahead and get into it. Question one is, do you plan your book purchases ahead or do you impulse buy? I would say that I'm kind of a mixture of both. If I end up at a bookstore, I'm certainly an impulse buyer. I don't go into like a bookstore with a list of books that I wanna go get. I just kind of, especially cause I tend to go to used bookstores sometimes, I tend to just scan the shelves cause you never know what they're gonna have. And so like if there's a collection that I'm working on, accruing or a book that I've been really dying to read, then I'll imp impulse buy those. However, lately I am a little bit more on a budget. I'm trying to make some <laughs> mature financial decisions and so, I am trying to be a little bit more intentional about the things that I purchase. So instead of going to bookstores and impulse buying things, I've been a little bit more choosy with what I buy. I've been looking strategically at, oh, I have this series and I'm missing this one book for the series, or oh, this, this book that uh, is coming out with my book of the month subscription, I really want that one. So I'm trying to rein in the impulse a little bit more and be a little more intentional. Number two. How do you decide what books to buy? <laughs> I guess this is kind of a mixed thing as well. So typically if I've already read the book and I want to buy it, it has to be rated at least a four stars in my opinion. Obviously ratings are subjective. I understand that, you know, just because something's a four star to me doesn't mean that it is to everyone else. But for my personal shelves, it either has to be a four or a five star rating and even with the four stars, I'm still trying to be very selective because I mean, I could end up with a million books just off of that criteria alone. So they have to be special to me in some way, moving in some way, unique in some way, something that I think 20 years down the road, I'll pick up that book and be like, oh my gosh, I really loved this book and it means something to me, not just having books for the sake of having books. So in terms of books already read, that's kind of how that goes. If I pick up books or acquire books, cause I don't always buy books. I get lots of books in trade or from publishers or from little free libraries and things. So if I, I do end up with books that I haven't read obviously. And for those books, like once I've read them, same thing. If they're not a four star or above and they're not in some way like special or mind blowing or revolutionary or memorable, then they go into a donation box for little free libraries. I have like three categories. I have a donation box for little free libraries. I have a area for like giveaways for like Instagram and stuff like that. And I have an area for books like that are gonna go to my mom because she might wanna read them. So yeah, I as I acquire the books, I read them and then decide basically what I wanna do with them on how I feel about the book after I've read it. Question number three, what is your philosophy on where you shop? Okay, so this asks a lot of like detailed questions like do you buy online or in person? Do you prefer used bookstores or new bookstores? Um, things like that. So I try my hardest to not shop at really big name stores. I have no hatred towards Barnes and Nobles. I think it's great or like the really big name bookstores. I think it's great that books are accessible and these big chains do bring books to places that sometimes there's no other bookstores. However, if there is an indie bookstore and the option is Barnes and Noble or an indie bookstore, I'm always choosing the indie bookstore. I feel very strongly, having run small businesses most of my life, I feel very, very strongly about supporting uh, small businesses. 
And I know that it is really difficult to run bookstores. I know it's hard to make those profit margins. And I really love seeing cool bookstores in the community. We have one here in Vegas called The Writer's Block, which is amazing. It has this great cafe. It's just this really cool, funky bookshop. There's lots of art. It's in the downtown art district. And it's just so perfect for our community. And it's the only really like new indie bookstore here. So I try my hardest to support them like if I wanna buy a new book. We do have a couple used bookstores here in Vegas. We have The Copper Cat, Las Vegas Book. So if I'm just looking to go scan through books, used bookstores, I do try to rotate through the, the three that, well, mainly the two that are closest to me. And then ultimately, like I said, I prefer to support local businesses over corporate businesses. As for online versus in-person, this is also kind of subjective. I do use Pango Books sometimes. I've been finding that I get a lot of great books there, uh, you know, for a little less expensive than you might find them in other places. And I'm on a bit of a budget. I think this is like one of the things that doesn't get talked about on BookTube Alive. You know, people are doing flashy hauls and, you know, you have beautifully curated shelves behind people, which I'm guilty of too. But I also do things to make it cost effective for me. So I do buy used books. I do tend to, to visit little free libraries. There are a plethora of libraries here in Las Vegas. I'm very fortunate for that. So I take books that I'm finished reading and I exchange them for new books in little free libraries. And I swap books with friends. I swap books with my mom. There's a lot of stuff that I do to make reading more affordable for myself. And so yeah, that kind of all ties into this philosophy around books. I do try my hardest like for authors that I really support or like friends that are publishing indie. I try my hardest to buy books when I can at full, at full price because I do really believe in supporting authors as well. Like I don't want it to all come across like, oh yeah, I don't ever buy new books. I'm only buying used books. I'm only getting little free library stuff. So I do buy some new books and I do like to support authors and their sales and everything. They just have to pick and choose. So I try to pick, you know, I try to spend, I basically, I try to spread my money around as effectively as possible. I try to balance between, you know, local shops and supporting different authors and things like that. Question number four is how do you feel about Little Free Libraries? I love Little Free Libraries. I am not gonna lie. I am here for the LFL trend. I'm so excited about it. My mom actually is the person that made me aware of Little Free Libraries. She has one at our, at our family home in San Diego. And if you're interested in checking it out, you can follow her on Instagram at LFL Book Adventures. So my mom is a voracious reader and my dad reads a lot too actually. And so my mom puts all these books out into little free libraries and it's become a gem in our little community. Uh, our neighbors have really kind of bonded over it. It's nice. So my mom has met so many people that she might not have met within our little community before. People bring her fruit, people trade her stuff, people stop and their kids draw like um, chalk drawings because my mom leaves like baskets of chalk out and stuff for the kids. So kids like leave nice artwork on the front of the house, all sorts of cool stuff. Like it's just such a beautiful bonding thing and it, extends in a lot of communities past simply just reading. It really becomes a source of conversation, a source of getting to know the people in your community, a source of joy for people. I mean, I see people that don't even take books. They just like walk and they look at it and it's interesting and it's curiosity. It's a conversation starter. And it just, I think it's just such a beautiful thing. And then taking it even a step further, reading tends to be a privilege of people that have, you know, money to spend. And whether you look at it like buying books, buying audiobooks, buying ebooks, whatever, it costs typically costs money. And and yes, there are libraries which resolve that money issue. However, there are lots of areas in the world where, or at least in this country, where libraries are not that accessible, right? And so having something like a little free library can make books accessible for somebody that might not have access to it. And so I feel particularly strongly about that. I think that, you know, having little free libraries in like really privileged communities where people have more access to books, sure, like it's cool, it's great. I'm not criticizing that. I'm still just as happy that people are spreading literacy and sharing books and whatnot. But I see it as like a necessity in underprivileged neighborhoods where people might not have access to the library for whatever reason. Like maybe the library isn't as well stocked. Maybe they don't have transportation to the library you know, there's various reasons. And so I think having these little community stopping points where people can get books is just incredibly important. So I feel very strongly about them, super passionate about it. I support them as much as possible. I'm sure that many of you have probably seen on this channel that I do little free library road trips. 
So whenever we go somewhere and we're going to be driving, I actually scout out all the little free libraries along the way and we stop and check them out and I bring them books because I have more books than I'm ever going to need and I continue to change my books out. So, you know, as I finish them, I want to pass them on to other people to enjoy and uh, little free libraries are so helpful in that goal. Question five, how do you feel after acquiring a book? Do you share like in a book haul or a book journal or anything like that? So definitely I get a dopamine hit after I bring home a book. There's no lie there, like it is an addictive feeling as is buying anything. I think most people when they're into buying stuff, whether it's books, shoes, household stuff, whatever, there's definitely a dopamine hit that comes with that process. I think with books, my big like overarching thing with it is that I also look at like, okay, I'm gonna read this, I can shoot this many photos with this, I can do this with this, I can talk about it in this this video, I can maybe create a recipe based on this. Like, I, I get excited about all the potential the book holds past just reading the book. And so that's really what brings that excitement. As far as sharing it, I do do book hauls, but I try not to do them like super constantly. Like, I don't want anyone to be under the perception that I haul home 40 books every month. Like I recently did a San Diego book haul, which you can find up here. It was like 40 something books, but that was for a random thing. Like that was going home to San Diego. We went to a whole bunch of little free libraries. I found a bunch of stuff in a used bookstore and a library. It was like a rarity and it was for my birthday. It wasn't like a normal thing. I don't normally go to the bookstore and come home with 40 books. And so I try not to like do too many really extreme book hauls. I do do like a book mail, haul video probably every two months or so but those are things that I'm receiving from publishers and I try to be clear with that in my videos like where those books came from from publishers from Goodreads giveaways from friends things like that like I'm not going like oh hey I'm always buying 40 or 50 books I just want that to be super super clear but I do try to share all the books that I bring home and talk about them as much as I can because that's the point of me reading and having this channel is to share books with you and talk about the books that I'm enjoying or the books I'm not enjoying too. Number six, how do you feel looking at your books that haven't been read? I guess they're asking if you feel guilty about having books that haven't been read. I don't feel that way. I try to keep book reading like as a fun thing for me. Like I don't want it to turn into an obligation. I've seen this a lot uh, discussed on booktube where booktube turns reading for a lot of people into this race, this crazy obligation where they have to be like, I'm reading 473 books every single month and ah, and I don't want that to be the thing for me. Like I got into reading because reading was a method of relaxation. My job as a chef is plenty intense without adding like intense deadlines and intense pressure to read a certain amount of stuff or to read a specific type of stuff. That's the other thing. I haven't like niched myself into one specific genre because I enjoy all sorts of genres. I like to read across a broad spectrum. And for me, reading is fun. I, I, I do all of this because it's supposed to be fun, not because I wanna feel guilty because I didn't read a certain amount in a, a month or because I have books that I haven't read or because I didn't read from a specific genre or whatever. Like for me, there's no negative feelings attached around my books. I'm happy. I dreamed my whole life of having a library and it's not exactly what I dreamed of right now. Like I don't have, you know, an actual library. I have a little apartment, but it makes me happy every day when I walk past my books and I'm like, I finally have, you know, the collection of books that I wanted and my apartment looks a certain way and I have stuff to read. I have ample things to read and I have stuff that I can lend. The other thing is part of this is a joy because I can lend my books to people. I can lend my books to my mom, to my friends. Like, it, it's just a lot of good feelings for me that comes around having these nice bookshelves. Question seven, how do you decide what is the right number of books that are unread to have? Uh, I, I don't, I don't set myself arbitrary numbers about like, oh, you can't get past this many unread books or like, I just read what I can read. And if I find a cool book in a little free library or I find a cool book that's really inexpensive at my library's like hardback sale, I'm gonna get it and I'm not gonna feel bad about it. Like, I, I feel like I read a pretty extensive amount of books every month. I feel like I change out my books pretty frequently. I'm usually somewhere between 20 to 30 books a month. And so honestly, I'm okay with that. Like, 
if there's some books that are sitting on my shelf unread for a while, it's okay, I'm gonna get there eventually. And I'm not gonna feel bad in the process. Number eight, do you have a process or some sort of TBR game for getting through your unread books? I do not have a specific TBR game. I do typically throughout the year theme out my TBR. Over the summer, I've taken a bit of a break and just let myself kind of mood read. So it's like a summer vacation sort of a deal. Just enjoying reading for the couple months without a, a guideline or like a specific genre or anything like that. But throughout the rest of the year, I do typically theme out my TBRs. So for example, in October, I typically do spooky season books because I'm all in the mood for Halloween. I'm decorating the house. I'm going to haunted houses and like doing all the Halloween stuff. And so part of that vibe for me is getting into like the horror thriller genre. And so what I do at that point is I look at my shelves and I go, let's look at all the books that are horror and, and thrillers and whatnot that I haven't read yet. And then I use those to create a TBR. But for the months where I don't necessarily have a concrete theme planned ahead, I'll look at my shelves and go, hey, I'm getting a whole bunch of science fiction books. Okay, we're gonna do a science fiction month. Or, oh my gosh, I'm like, buried in historical fiction, time to do a historical fiction month. So that helps me to rotate through the books that are sitting on my shelf. Number nine, do you have a book buying problem? If so, what is the nature of it and can it be adjusted? I don't think I have a book buying problem. The way that I would, I guess, classify it problem is when it starts to interfere with the rest of your life. So like if you think of a typical like alcohol addiction, right? Alcohol becomes toxic it becomes the point where it's uncontrolled you're spending money you don't have you're harming the people in your life and that is a problematic behavior in the case of book buying I don't buy books if I can't afford them so if I have something that needs my money I don't buy books if I'm tight on my budget one month I don't buy books if I have to prioritize something else I don't buy books it's not that complicated and because I live somewhere where there's lots of little free libraries, like I said, I have ample opportunities to exchange books for free. I also have an amazing library by my house that often has really, really great, like they have a little bookstore in the library and they have really great selections and they cost like two bucks. So if I really, really feel like I need a book, like if I walk in and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's this book on the shelf that I've been wanting, it's two dollars, you know? And for me, two dollars is not going to break the bank. So I try my hardest to not spend exorbitant amounts of money on books. I guess that's the bottom line is that like when you see a big book haul and I'm like, oh, I bought a bunch of books. Usually it's at the lowest cost possible. I'm definitely not somebody that's throwing away hundreds and hundreds of dollars on books every month. Certainly I do spend some money. I won't pretend like I don't, but not a catastrophic amount, certainly. And I wouldn't encourage anyone else to do that either. I think that if you're you know, in a position where you can't afford to buy books, like don't feel like there's pressure that you're not an, you know, don't feel the pressure to think that you have to have books on your shelves at home to qualify as an avid reader. I mean, ebooks, library books, all of those things are perfectly fine. And I did that myself for many, many years. Like there's tons of time in my life where I couldn't afford the book. So yeah, I wouldn't necessarily classify my book buying habit as a problem. I do bring home a decent amount of books between little free libraries and book exchanges and things like that, but they all manage to fit on my shelves. They stay organized. I don't have like massive stacks where I have nowhere to put them. And on the rare occasion where I start to get a little bit full on the bookshelves, then I clear them out. And so I think I keep it pretty reasonably under control. Maybe Oz might debate that a little bit, but you know, I think all things considered, it's a pretty healthy situation. All right, and question number 10 or prompt number 10 is to tag a handful of accounts. So again, thank you to Bookish for tagging me in this originally. I'm sorry that it took me so long to get to this. As I mentioned, just some health stuff got in the way, but it's here now. I really appreciate the tag. And if you don't already follow Bookish, you should definitely go check out his account. He has a lot of great stuff. He talks about a lot of really current and relevant topics aside from just books. He often obviously relates the books back to those current topics, but I find his channel to be phenomenally aware of the world around him. And he's so thoughtful in the way that he says things and the issues that he chooses to, to speak on. And I really appreciate his channel a lot. So definitely check him out. And I'm gonna be tagging three channels as well. So I'm gonna tag Books and Cooks, 
I'm going to tag Lola's La La Land, and I'm going to tag Tom L.A. Books. All three also great accounts. Two of them are a little smaller. Tom L.A. Books is a bigger account, so likely you already follow him. But if you're not following any of these three as well, check them out. Great channels. I enjoy watching them. They're all lovely people. So thank you again for sticking through this video with me. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, you know what to do. Hit the thumbs up button and comment down below. Do you have a book buying problem? Let me know. Do you have a lot of books at home or are you like more of an ebook reader? I'm, I'm curious. I personally can't do the ebook thing because it gives me migraines, but I am envious of everyone that can because it seems so nice and organized to have it all like at the palm of your hand. And finally, if you're not already subscribed to this channel, you know what to do, hit the subscribe button. I do post regular bookish content, lots of fun stuff here. So I would love to see you in another video. Thank you so much for joining. I'm Caitlin Bandy and this is my channel, Bandy's Books.